I'm Nikki Jobbikik from Lookup Strata, and for today's webinar session, I'm joined by Drew McKillican, Executive Manager of Energy Services at Altogether. In this webinar, we're talking about embedded energy networks in New South Wales and Queensland. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. Very shortly, we will be joined by Drew McCallican from Altogether Group. Drew is the Executive Manager of Energy at Altogether Group. They deliver affordable, reliable energy to communities across Australia. Drew has more than 20 years experience in commercial management across energy and telecommunication utilities, including embedded networks, energy retail, regulatory carbon markets, networks and wholesales, both in United Kingdom and in Australia. Drew specialises in the commercial development of consumer and large commercial retail products in energy and finds innovative ways to deliver low cost operational programs to create nimble, profitable and environmentally sustainable retail businesses. Drew believes strongly in the post centralised utility era, the needs of clients and the importance of localised bespoke customer centric services. Altogether Group regularly appears in our monthly New South Wales and Queensland Strata magazines and have been contributing to questions about energy networks and water usage received in from the Lookup Strata audience. Welcome, Drew, and thanks so much for joining us today. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Nikki, for that very uh, flattering introduction. Uh, great. Um, well, look, guys, it's, uh, it's great to be able to speak to you all today um, about a subject that I get really a little bit excited about. Um, so I'll try to temper my enthusiasm so uh, I don't come across too, uh, too nerdy. But yes, we're here today to, to talk about uh, embedded energy networks. Uh, and to Nikki's point, this is predominantly uh, directed to, to, to the strata industry and to body corporates. And really we're looking, we're predominantly covering the areas of Queensland and New South Wales. And just as a, if there is anybody on the line uh, from Victoria, just uh, it's important probably to stress that uh, Victoria run, un, operates under quite a, a unique uh, regulatory regime under the local authorities. So a lot of what we talk about in terms of regulations doesn't apply to that state, but they do apply to New South Wales and Queensland. So to kick off, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit just broadly, and this may be uh, teaching people to suck eggs uh, about what is an embedded network, because we, we, we hear the term thrown around often, uh, and quite often it's a little bit misunderstood. So I think it's just worth uh, recapping what an embedded network is. So an embedded network isn't just about electricity. An embedded network is any network within a community uh, where, where utilities are distributed uh, throughout that community to, to endpoints. Now, that sounds a little bit broad, and, and actually it is, because what that means is actually every multi-dwelling community operates as an embedded network. Uh, even if you're buying electricity directly from AGL uh, or Alinta and you're not part of an exempt selling regime, you are still within an embedded network. And it's a, it is an important distinction because the, uh, the supply and carriage of electricity is a heavy regulated sector. So we, when we talk about embedded networks, it's, it's electricity, it's, it's gas. Uh, in many communities in Queensland and New South Wales in particular, it's also hot, centralized hot water, where hot water plants are centralized in a, in, a, in a strata community and then distributed through internal pipe work. So residents essentially don't have their own hot water plant. That's a, that would be a, an embedded hot water system. In some communities also recycled and drinking water can be embedded and, uh, and also wastewater. So it is quite broad, but today we'll be talking predominantly around anything related to energy. And energy is electricity, gas, and thermal. And thermal being the technical uh, term for things like hot water and air conditioning systems. So most of you on the group will either live in or, or manage an embedded network of some kind. Now, the reason embedded networks are really interesting is because, and you know, you don't have to go too far to read the news about what's going on uh, in the energy sector at the moment, is that the traditional uh, supply of electricity is, as we all know, large power stations, typically outside of cities, generate electricity and deliver it to your property. Now that's the, what we call centralized generation. And it really came into fruition uh, in, from the 1940s onwards and it, when, when these systems were owned by government. 
But as populations have grown and energy usage has changed, and that's the most substantial thing here is how people use power differently, those traditional systems are no longer able to, uh, to hold up to, to users' demand. And a, and a good example would be, uh, you know, traditionally people have a, rel a relatively predictable electricity use pattern. You get up in the morning, you turn your kettle on, you have your breakfast, you go to work, you come home at the end of the day, watch some TV and go to bed. So you could, you could, you could match, you could actually mirror uh, or, or plot out the way people use electricity. And that meant that when they built these centralized systems, they built sufficient capacity to handle these different types of usage. As technology evolves and people's needs change, that usage profile has changed significantly. And, the, and in the years ahead, in the very near term, we'll be changing even, even uh, more significantly, particularly with the advent of electric vehicles, where not only are you making breakfast and watching a bit of TV, but you're charging your car, you're charging your phones, you're running more air conditioning units, and the, and the traditional systems are struggling to, uh, to hold up that type of capacity. And the level of investment required to augment those systems so that it can handle future demand is really significant. It's quite great. But the problem with that, of course, is you have to spend a lot of money upgrading the systems. <laughs> and when usage is peaking, i.e. people are using a lot more power in short periods of time, you don't actually have enough usage over a whole period of time or a whole day to recover those costs in an affordable manner. In order to meet those high demand peaks, you need to have sufficient capacity and the cost of, it, of that capacity is, is, is really quite extraordinary. And, then, and we'll come on to talk a little bit about what that looks like in terms of magnitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with these embedded networks, in, in, particularly in strata communities, um, they are, as I mentioned, they're heavily regulated. And regardless of whether you've got an embedded network, which is being managed through a body corporate firm or through a body corporate themselves. And when I say that, I mean, um, the residents in the building are paying the body corporate or a private business, not a retailer for the electricity they use, or if they're connected directly to AGL or Origin, it is still an, an embedded network and it still falls under the regulatory regime. And that, regula re, uh, that regulatory regime creates uh, uh, responsibilities and liabilities for the operator and the operator of these embedded networks is actually the body corporate. Uh, and, uh, in, and looking at some of the questions we've been asked, uh, it'll, that's a, that'll be an important point that we'll, we'll cover a little bit later on. The distinction between whether you would really know you have an embedded network is whether or not there's an, an on sale of energy. So the buyer of energy being the body corporate or, the, or a strata firm, and the seller of energy also being the body corporate or strata firm. In that arrangement, you would be operating under what's known as a regulatory exemption. So a regulatory exemption is, uh, because the industry is heavily regulated, you either must be approved by the government to sell and supply electricity, or you must be explicitly exempt by the government from needing to be approved, which is sort of a little bit like a quasi approval. Um, so that's what we, so those of you who've heard of embedded network exemptions, or you, you may actually be subject to an exemption yourself, or you may be deemed an exempt customer yourself, that's the arrangement we're talking about. Now, although these body corporates seem to be exempt from needing to be authorized, that exemption comes with a, with a series of caveats. And the caveats essentially are that uh, the reason parties have to be authorized is, is because we're providing essential services uh, i.e. services that are required for quality of life, heating, cooling, uh, ability to cook, uh, wash your hair, all of that kind of stuff. Um, those services are covered by minimum protections. So even if you're not an energy seller yourself uh, or you're selling under an exemption, you still must ensure those consumers receive those minimum protections that they're entitled to. And, uh, and they, if you are an exempt holder or a or an authorized retailer, if you fail to meet those exemptions, uh, those conditions, or fail to provide the consumers with the protections under the law they're entitled to, there are some very steep uh, uh, penalties that can be imposed, uh, and they can actually be both either civil or, depending on the nature of the non-compliance, it could actually be criminal. And we'll come on to talk a little bit about that shortly too. Um, I'm assuming that on this call, we've got predominantly customers that are living, uh, residents and body corporate managers who are running communities that have registered embedded networks. So embedded networks, 
uh, where the body corporate is the on-seller or the body corporate ha has appointed a business to act as the on-seller. So in most cases, uh, these penalties would apply to all of those types of networks. Most importantly, or the most topical point when we talk about these registrable and embedded networks is there's two areas of, of I suppose, uh, contention broadly. And I should say, I'll caveat this before I, uh, before I dig into it, which is that the vast majority of embedded networks and embedded network operators operate their networks exceptionally well and in the interest of the community. Uh, and that's, and, and I would say that we do that. And I would say there are a number of other parties out there that, that have good ethical standards. There are a few businesses out there, uh, depending on when they first entered the market and depending on their relationship with the developer or the body corporate management firm or the body corporate themselves, that may not have a con commercial structure that is providing the type of, of advantage a community should, should expect. Um, and so that typically always boils down to something very, very straightforward, which is how much do people pay for their energy? So, you know, we talk about all these complicated issues around why embedded networks exist, distribution, supply, you know, this is why embedded networks exist and why they're important. But what really matters to the people that live in these communities is, is the amount they pay for the energy they use. So actually, and also the sustainability of the energy they, they use, which is becoming an increasingly important uh, important point. So I wanted to take a little bit of a, a moment to explain uh, exactly how uh, the costs of the supply of energy you're receiving uh, are, are sort of built up. And this might give you a little bit of uh, assess. It allows you to assess a little bit yourself as to whether or not you're paying about the right amount or if you're paying too much or too little. I doubt you'll find anyone that says they're paying too little for their, uh, for their utilities. So in a non-embedding network, so let's talk about, you know, you live in a house on a street and you're connected from a cable wire, cable uh, running down your street, obviously not an embedded network, this is traditional network supply. This often surprises people, but the vast majority of every dollar you pay is actually for that pole and wire. And this can vary between you know, 20 and 60% of every dollar that you spend is actually just paying for the infrastructure that's delivering power to your property. And in this little cost stack, which I'll cover in a moment, you see that here as the network component. Why pricing is different in embedded networks is that this network component, because it, your network is, you can't choose your network, you either live in the Energex region or Osgrid or Western Power Network, you, it's, a, it's a monopoly. These are actually private or semi-private businesses. Because it's a monopoly, that charge is actually regulated by the Australian Energy Regulator. The, the distributors have some say, in, in what the price should be, but the price ultimately has to be approved by the regulator. And it's done by category and it has to be done on what's called a cost recovery plus basis. So the distributors work out the cost of delivering power to a type of property and they can add a, a margin to recover some, uh, some margin for, for their investors and just their cost of doing their work. When you look at the, a, a traditional uh, high rise building, Obviously you may have 200 apartments in one single building. And then you look at a single house and you'll have one house in that, on that particular lot. Under the standard rules, the cost that is paid by the resident is the same regardless of whether you're in a high rise community as it would be if you're in a house. But clearly it costs far less to deliver uh, electricity per lot to a high rise community than it would a house. And, you know, in some cases, these houses can be five or 10 or 15 kilometers away from the neighboring house. And then in a city area, you've got a very high volume and a relatively low dense uh, populated area, uh, sorry, high de highly densely populated area. So unfortunately, what that typically means is people living in high rise buildings are paying significantly more than, they, than it's costing to service them than they would if they lived in a house. With embedded networks, you can get around that. You can get around it because a body corporate is a commercial entity. It's a not, it's not, it doesn't operate as a business, but it is a commercial entity and it has an ABN and it, and it, does, it does have the distinction as a, of a business. So when you uh, install an embedded network where you have private metering to the end delivery point, that the classification of that delivery point is no longer residential, it's commercial, which means you fall into a significantly lower cost bracket for delivery than you would externally. So that can reduce the cost of networks from this 20 to 
down to 10 to 15 percent that and and if you think about that if someone's paying a thousand dollars a year for their electricity that can actually reduce that thousand dollars down to say six or seven hundred dollars so in a typical embedded network and this is only an example what you would see is a cost stack that looks something like this this graph bar on the left is you now how much you would pay in a year for a typical resident and then this is all the deductions to cover the cost that's been supplied to that typical resident. The actual electricity component is quite small. The electricity that is generated by the power station is typically only 10 to 15% of your total cost. Renewables and, uh, and, and other charges that are mand mandatory is another component and networks. So this network saving or this reduction in network cost is the, is the cost difference between an embedded network and a non-embedded network. Now, the, this then begs the question, who's getting the benefit of that cost saving if the customer isn't getting a price that's significantly lower than you would see on the ordinary marketplace? And this is where, this is the core question we always get asked about embedded networks. And the short answer is, it depends, which is not really a short answer. Um, undoubtedly, the majority of the benefit of that saving should always be passed on to the community and the community being the resident, the owner of a property and the body corporate. So this, and you will find, again, depending on, on where you live, there's a huge variance in the benefit that's been passed on to these communities. But I want to set the record straight on that. If you are not getting the vast majority of that benefit, you're probably not getting a really great deal. And it's, it's always worth talking to your embedded network provider or your body corporate about whether or not you're, you're getting a fair deal. And you can ask, uh, different body corporates will be less or more open to sharing this information with you, but you can ask for them to provide some more of this detail. Similarly, these prices are actually regulated. So you should make sure that you and your residents and your body corporates are aware of what the pricing is that they can actually charge. In some cases they can charge uh, significantly more than they are allowed to under the regulations and sometimes significantly less. So when we, I'm pretty sure when we get to the questions, we'll be able to, to explore this a little bit more. There are a bunch of other costs involved in operating your network. Clearly you have electricity metering. Uh, people need to read those meters. Those meters need to be repaired. People need to produce electricity bills, send them to you and do payment processing. And that's all these other costs you see down here. And the residual is either uh, can should typically be passed back to the body corporate or it should be used to ensure that the infrastructure is well maintained and upgraded through that embedded network. We talked a little bit about the obligation. So if you are an embedded network uh, supplier or, or a body corporate that's on selling through an exemption, you have a series of, of, of uh, obligations as we've touched on. These are the price you're selling is regulated. And if you don't know what that is, um, then, then you should, and, and we would we can help you understand what that would look like. It is important because, as I said, there are significant penalties for not meeting this obligation. Uh, and you know, the, for an exemption holder, the, the regulator can fine a body corporate twenty thousand dollars per incident, and an incident is a customer. So if you have a hundred customers and you price them all incorrectly, um, that's a hundred penalties that they could impose. Now they rarely do, particularly on body corporates, because that would be you know, counterintuitive because ultimately the resident would end up having to, to contribute to that penalty, but it is worth being aware. You also have lots of obligations around billing and payment support. So this is, you know, the format and the layout of the bills that you're supplying are actually regulated. And what we do find, and this is a really important point, is a lot of body corporate management firms are, bill, are providing these invoices on behalf of their clients without realizing that that invoice actually is subject to regulation. And often these invoices are generated out of strata management fund software companies. You can pick your pick your uh, pick your poison. There's lots of them out there. Um, but the and these systems are not designed to handle these types of invoices. So if you are invoicing out of a strata management firm platform, you are probably or most likely uh, to to not be compliant with the regulations. And there are a number of other key issues as well, such as hardship, network maintenance and procurement. Uh, now, hardship has been very topical over the last couple of years uh, with COVID. You know, a lot of customers, a lot of residents of strata communities have seen reductions in income or reduction in working hours or, or worse. Um, these customers, as essential services customers, have minimum 
a minimum level of uh, protection. And if those customers are not given and granted those protections, and unfortunately, we have seen an awful lot of this, um, uh, then there can be really severe penalties. And these can actually move into the criminal space. So for example, uh, and we obviously will never mention names, but we've seen body corporates for legitimate commercial reasons who, um, who because they're responsible for the cost of electricity, when a customer or a resident hasn't been able to pay for the electric that electricity, they put those customers under pressure to pay, or worse, they've disconnected those customers. Now that's 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 very significant in terms of a breach, a withdrawal of someone's essential service. It's a really significant thing to do, and and has is detrimental to the resident and is also illegal and has exposed body corporates to 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 recourse from uh, from the regulators. Network maintenance goes without saying anything that's internal to the building all the reticulation pipe work electricity cabling that's in the rises and behind the walls they're actually the property of the the body corporate uh, and the maintenance uh, obligations that come as an exempt holder are legally binding on the body corporate and obviously there's a cost associated with that procurement is simply the uh, the, the purchase of electricity at the at the main supply point so body corporates are buying electricity um, usually quite a significant volume. And when you buy a large volume of electricity, there are some really good deals to be had. But if you just go to market individually, you're going to get a pretty bad price. Um, so it's always worth uh, finding a partner that can help you consolidate your electricity consumption to get better pricing. And the most important thing of all, which uh, is something that not a lot of people know about, if you're supplying electricity, um, and you're, let's say, for example, you've got more than 100 people in your in your body corporate building, there's a very high chance that one of those customers requires electricity for life support. Now that sounds a bit dramatic, but this can be anything from, you know, a person has a medical condition that requires them to stay under a certain temperature so they use their air conditioner more often, or maybe they have dialysis machine, maybe they have a defibrillator that needs to be on standby. Um, these customers are actually protected by law. And if their power is disrupted, you're doing maintenance work, then you have very serious obligations to ensure those customers are properly notified and given sufficient time to ensure they have backup in place. And this is again one of those areas that can move into really severe penalties if it's if it's if it's done wrong. It's never intentionally done wrong. It's only ever done wrong as a as a mistake. Now, there. So, how do you avoid all of this complicated? It all sounds really complicated, right? If this was the case, why would anyone even bother with the networks? Well, the answer is really straightforward. Um, body corporates don't actually have to take on all of these obligations themselves. Uh, and in fact, they shouldn't take on these obligations themselves. The, the regulator would prefer body corporates not to be subject to these obligations because they're complicated and the nuanced to the electricity industry. So what is, has been happening over the last few years uh, is that um, providers have been working with the regulators to increase their level of understanding and their compliance capability internally and have been applying to the regulators to be granted uh, the, an authorization to supply this electricity on behalf of body corporates themselves under their own entity as a license holder. And what that does essentially is it ensures that all the obligations of the supply of energy is transferred from the body corporate uh, to that provider. Um, so what we always encourage, and we're not the only ones out there, I'll, biasly I will tell you that we're the, be that we're the best, um, but there are others out there and it's always worth um, making sure you're talking to other people too, so you have a comparison point, is if you have embedded networks in your portfolio or you are an embedded network uh, resident or, or owner in, a bed, in an embedded network uh, with an exemption, ensure that you're talking to an authorized participant, an authorized uh, retailer, such as the Altogether Group, and then there are a number of, uh, of others out there. If you're being supplied services by a third party, and that third party is not an authorized uh, retailer, um, it's worth having a look at whether or not they're properly mitigating all of your risk and your obligations under your exemption. Because if you're being supplied services by essentially an agent, then they may be doing all the work and collecting all the revenue, but you still hold all of the obligations and the, and the penalties that would be imposed would be imposed against you and your uh, and your body corporate itself. So that's a lot of information. Um, apologize, it's very difficult to squeeze 
uh, years worth of embedded network history into, into a 25 minute session. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of background. I think what, to, to make it more pointed, it's probably worth throwing uh, open to some questions and that may help us get into some of the nitty gritty of the kind of experiences people are having at the moment. Nikki. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ju. Um, that was fantastic. Now, like you said, we've got some questions that were submitted by the audience and um, we thank our audience because the questions that we're receiving are absolutely excellent. Drew and I were talking about them as we came onto the session earlier before we started. Um, so if I could just get you to unshare your screen at this point, Drew, that'd be great and we'll jump into them. And this will help explain some of the points that Drew's been talking about and give it a bit more of a... Um, sort of a practical um, aspect. So uh, we should be really interesting. So I'll start with the first one. So the first one here we've got is from Tracy. Um, so this is applicable for New South Wales and Queensland, I believe. I'm a property manager and I have a few properties in complexes where embedded networks exist. I'm often asked by tenants how they can leave the embedded networks due to the prices charged. They sometimes find these are not the best in the market. Can you please explain how to go about leaving and what impacts there are for anybody corporate, the owner and the tenant? And this is a really great question. And so it gets to the heart of what we've just been discussing. So the bottom line is there's two, there's two parts to this. Firstly, if you're in an embedded network and you're not getting a better deal than you could get if you were to leave the network, then, then something is fundamentally wrong with the arrangement you have with your, with your on-seller or the on-seller's agent. Because as I just explained, the cost structures of embedded networks are such that you, you th there are almost no circumstances in which you should be paying more and, and you should be paying significantly less. So first point there is I think there's, that there are questions to be answered as to why you're not, the, the residents are not getting a better deal because they absolutely should be. And the second part to that is, um, it is a matter of law now that customers, all residents, whether you're in embedded network or not, are entitled to exercise their power of choice. So a resident absolutely can leave an embedded network. Um, again, they shouldn't need to because they should always be getting the best deal. Um, now, in order to do that, depending on the age of the network and the supplier that built the network, and this is an important point, uh, the infrastructure you have being the electricity meter you have may not actually be uh, meet the necessary standards to be supplied electricity by the normal marketplace. So again, when we talked about if, uh, if you were to use an authorized provider, that authorized provider um, is, is likely to, and certainly with us, we, we do this as a default when we step in as the authorized party managing an embedded network for our clients, we, if those meters do not provide the resident with, the, with the freedom to choose another retailer with, without having to invest in new infrastructure, then we will, we will install that infrastructure at our own cost. So uh, it absolutely can be done. The embedded network would have, when these laws change, appointed an embedded network manager and the embedded network providers, so your body corporate or, uh, or the agent that's operating on their behalf, if you ask them for the details of the, their, your embedded network manager, they will provide you with those details and a phone number, and they are legally obliged without a cost to you to assist you in selecting an alternative product of your choice. So that's really, really important. And um, you do have that right. If you're being, and this does happen, unfortunately, we see it sometimes, if they're sort of implying that you can't or trying to um, uh, dissuade you from doing it, that's, that is a breach of their obligations. They, this is a, you have absolutely the right to choose your own supplier of choice. If you, if uh, maybe leave your details privately, if you need us to help you with that, you know, we're more than happy to give you more information. Thanks, thanks, Drew, that's great. And that's, um, yeah, really great information for everyone I would imagine, because I'm not sure many people know about that arrangement. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, okay, this one was from Graham and it's from Queensland. Um, it, it is a bit lengthy, but there's some good information in there, so bear with me. Um, I'm an owner in a strata that's billed for electricity via Altogether Solutions, operating under the exemption scheme. We're investigating EB charging, but have realised there's, there's a lot more to this exercise. Example, smart load management. 
So I have a couple of questions relating to the cost recovery of body corporate network upgrading. Could Altogether Solutions set up a financial special purpose vehicle to finance, pay interest and recover the costs to cover the replacement of existing manual meters with smart meters? The aim is to add a line item to the owner's bill over, say, two years, avoiding any financial workload on the committee other than oversight. Could this same special purpose vehicle business model, model be used to recover costs of upgrading the electricity network to include an EV charging system? The body corporate to supply a 30 a amp terminal box to individual car parks. The EV owner to have two extra line items on the altogether solution bill to recover the share of the wiring costs and the actual electricity consumed by the EV. Could the special purpose vehicle model be applied to a rooftop solar PV installation, this time to the account of the body corporate common area electricity consumption and can altogether solutions act as a broker to negotiate bulk electricity contracts? We have around 25 strata apartment developments nearby. Could this offer economy of scale for the participating apartment buildings? So I know there's a, quite a lot in there, Drew. I'll go back to <laughs> you a, to cover some of those. <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's a big question and we could I could spend all day answering it. So what I'll do is um, we would like to uh, obviously we can speak to Graham outside of this to get right into the nitty gritty but to answer the question broadly for for the group um, there are no types of arrangements that we don't consider so we uh, absolutely would want to work with a client that's looking for an EV or solar type solution um, to help them find a solution that is tailor suited to that body corporate and, and the reason I say that is like an SPV is a very specific type of arrangement and it may be the most cost effective arrangement but what we will always look to do is to and is to work out what's the most the lowest cost uh, structure to put in place depending on the community and typically the things that are driving uh, the main input drivers to things like costs of installing EV infrastructure in existing buildings are really the building size how many EV charges they want the the existing infrastructure installation whether that needs to be upgraded or not and of course how big the car park is because you can't just put a you know that, you can't just run an extension lead out you've got to install this additional infrastructure. So depending on the number of lots that are available, depending on how many EV charges they want, depending on what the current infrastructure is, um, that will dictate the cost. And once we know what the cost is, and as I said, there's no easy cheat table for this. Every, every site is very, very unique. Um, we, we can work on some type of funding arrangement. What we typically look to do is fund the infrastructure. Uh, so. Uh, ourselves, but not through an SPV. What we would look to do is say, look, uh, as we talked about before, you know, you've got your electricity rates. There's a there's there's a delta between uh, what the market is charging and and what the cost is in an embedded network. Um, we always aim to make sure the customer is getting the best possible deal and far lower than what they can get on the on the market. But if we can take a, an amount of that delta, it could be a relatively small amount and spread that over a period of time, essentially that can be used to fund these infrastructure upgrades. And the reason that's attractive to body corporates is because it means they don't have to raise special levies. We will fund it and we'll recover that cost over a term uh, from, the, from the users themselves. And so it's always a user pays system. Uh, that's always advantageous because um, user pays always gives you far more efficient outcomes. So when the user is paying for their infrastructure, they will always use that infrastructure far more wisely. Um, if the body corporate or an investor owner or a special levy is having, having to be raised to pay for that infrastructure, people's usage tends to be a little bit more um, ad hoc, let's put it that way. So you don't get always get the best commercial outcome. But so I don't know if that actually answers, it does, certainly doesn't answer the full question uh, for Graham, but we'll, uh, if Graham can leave us his details, we'll definitely get in touch. Um, because he's already one of our clients as well. So we should be able to work on this detail pretty quickly uh, and look at what we can do specifically for that particular site. Okay, that sounds good. And just for any of any buildings out there, uh, we've had so many questions about people looking at and exploring options with EV charging and, and getting um, retrofitting and getting their buildings ready for what's happening in the future. So if you're not looking at it at the moment, I'd suggest it's definitely something that you should be looking at. Absolutely. 
Okay. All right. So John from New South Wales, this next one. Uh, could you please list the five most important areas in an embedded network service providers contract that the owners corporation should assess when considering one provider over another? How limited are an OC's options when trying to change embedded network providers when that provider owns significant assets like the electrical distribution infrastructure in a strata scheme? And what is your view on the property of an embedded network provider owning common property infrastructure in a strata scheme and how should this best be disclosed to prospective and existing owners? This is, this is a very good question and actually gets really to the heart of some of the practices that we've seen historically in embedded networks. So look, and it's a, it's a bit of a vexed uh, area for embedded networks. Essentially, um, anything that's related to the reticulation, so the wiring, so anything from the switchboard to an individual lot should be the property of the body corporate. So just to answer that, that second question first, and everything else can be the property of the body corporate, or it can be the property of another party, but it's actually relatively limited infrastructure, and it's infrastructure that needs to be maintained and replaced quite often. So it shouldn't really be a major issue now. I think where this question is coming from is that there are providers out there um, that have historically done deals with developers. So when a property is under construction, they will supply uh, quite a large amount of the infrastructure to building at their own cost. And then the developer hands that to the inaugural body corporate when the building is complete and the first set of residents are moving in uh, and the body corporates essentially, you know, the, the, the buyers are buying these apartments, but they don't own a lot of the infrastructure in their community. Um, now, if you want to exit those arrangements, the, the issue you typically have is you then have to buy that infrastructure off that incoming, uh, that, that exiting provider. And depending on the nature of the infrastructure that's been installed and the scale of it, that can be really significant. You know, it could be millions of dollars, which clearly, you know, most body corporates are not going to, uh, and owners are not going to be able to sort of weather that level of cost, which brings me to your five most important areas to consider when building a looking at an OC contract for an embedded network operator. What infrastructure are they going to install and what valuation have they applied to that infrastructure? It's not unreasonable for a third party to provide infrastructure for you and to fund it. What is unreasonable is you not having the ability to then later exit that arrangement and, and, and purchase that uh, uh, infrastructure at a reasonable cost. And the reasonable cost essentially being a cost plus maybe a little bit for their time, and at a depreciated value, that's a linear depreciated value. Typically in some, depending on the, on the provider, the, those termination costs can be set to such a level that there's no real way the body corporate could ever uh, purchase that. And I think there's a question mark there as to whether or not that then is an unconscionable contract. So that's an area you should always look at first. Obviously the second point is term. How long are they asking you to be bound for and what exit points do you have along that term? Because when you're appointing a provider, typically in body corporate, you know, maybe if you're appointing lift maintenance or, or cleaning or concierge services or body corporate management firms, these are reasonably long contracts. They'd be one, two, three years. Typically with energy infrastructure contracts, you're looking at 10 years, uh, 10 to 15 years. These are really long contracts. So make sure you've covered what your ability is to exit uh, these, uh, these contracts and the cost of exiting these contracts. Um, and the other points are really simple ones. Make sure that there's nothing in the contract that means that you can't have an influence on the price. So if there is an ability to change the retail price, which there absolutely should be, um, that there's some mechanism within that contract that sets a, some just some basic principle rules as to what will trigger those price changes. So that it's maybe it's cost-based or inflation-based, but it's not just a blank check for the supplier to change their price at their own discretion. Because once you're in those long-term contracts, and particularly if you have large termination, costs that can be um, that can be really dangerous for you and the, the other two points are ensuring that the provider has the necessary authorizations to supply those services to you uh, and that they will guarantee you contractually that all your consumers are re receiving their necessary protections so that's a long-winded answer but it's a really complex uh, question but they're the main five things I would say look out for in those contracts 
Excellent. Thanks, Drew. That's really great information for everyone to know. We've just had a question come through from somebody um, saying, from John saying, thanks for raising the issue around asset ownership by embedded networks. Very difficult for OCs to buy back their assets. It's not what the average owner is expecting to have to do. So yeah, I think mm. most people are, yeah, are, are happy that we've raised that point. That's great. And once again, just if, I, if, if, if I can just make a quick comment on that, which is that um, it's not always, it's not necessarily the case that the body corporate would need to do that. So if the body corporate is looking to change their embedded network supplier, your another supplier may be prepared to pay buy those assets for you, um, because again, what you're not aware, what we don't know is what kind of margin and costs your current supplier has that is all up, you know, above the line. So your new incoming provider could very well take that infrastructure on for you, buy out those contracts depending on the commercials, and still give you a far better outcome in terms of ongoing electricity costs. So it's always worth, you know, even if you're in an existing contract, reach out to alternative providers and talk to them about what they're able to do because they may actually be able to solve that problem for you. Great. Uh, okay, so we've got one from Bob. This is back up in Queensland. Uh, so the history of the complex was developed around 2006 with a horizontal embedded network to service 140 villas. The complex is connected to the Ergon Energy Grid. The individual owners gradually installed solar systems within the complex from 1.5 kilowatts up to 5 kilowatt systems. In 2019, Ergon Energy conducted an audit and advised the body corporate that the complex had reached 30 kilowatts of generation. This this generation was from approximately 14 owners and that capacity cannot be extended without a switchboard upgrade. The solar energy playing field rules and regulations changed from 2006 to 2019 under the direction of state regulators. How can, I, how can our body corporate move forward, particularly in respect as to what ballpark costs may be? Is there any state compensation available since the rules have changed over time? <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So this, again, is, I'll try and I could talk forever on this point. And we do, we, uh, <laughs> I get involved in this quite quite a lot. I can't ask the question about uh, right now, but I'll, I'll look into it around any sort of state compensation. But to explain the reason why there's, uh, why Ergon are asking for that infrastructure to be upgraded, if you go right back to the start of my presentation, which was quite complex of, and a long time ago, uh, we talked about the fact that the distribution markets are changing and they're trying to manage all these different sort of considerations and they can't keep up. One of the, an example of that is where you have an embedded network, whether it's vertical or horizontal, it's more prevalent in the horizontal because you've got more roof space for solar, um, where you have a large amount of solar and 30 kilowatts is the limit. Uh, you've got electricity, typically these networks are designed that you have a power station, it flows in one direction and ends up at a property. When you start installing generation at that property and the generation size is so great that actually it runs the probability that it's going to send electricity back the other way it starts to cause problems for the network to be able to manage the security and frequency of the energy that's in the network so what they're actually they're not asking for the switchboard to be upgraded per se what they're asking for is for the community to install what's called a protection relay and that protection relay allows them to control the energy flowing back out into the network so this is just, this is unfortunately, it's, it's not a really around regulation as much as it is around the fact that the um, in, uh, energy generation within embedded networks, if they're not managed properly in low demand managed, which means you're controlling how much power has been generated and where it's going, it can actually call into question, uh, or it can put at risk the integrity of the upstream network. And that's when you start moving into the risk of things like brownouts and blackouts and power surges. So they put these restrictions in place. Uh, again, if I could get a little bit more detail on it, I can probably uh, help Bob more specifically with this case, but that hopefully gives you an answer as to why this is being asked for in the first place. It's not, um, it's not a regulatory thing. It's actually around ensuring the network integrity is retained. Okay, thanks, Drew. And when you've mentioned um, you're, you're sort of happy to talk to people, we'll also, of course, be providing your contact information as well. So anyone right. that's written in and they've, um, yeah, and uh, Drew's mentioned that he's happy to sort of go into more detail, feel, feel free to contact him by the information that we will provide as well. Uh, okay, so this one is um, in New South Wales from Tony. Um, I live in a unit block in North Kellyville in New South Wales. We bought off the plan and there was no mention of, in, of an embedded network being in our building. We found out at our first AGM and were asked to sign off on the network without really knowing anything about it or how it worked. 
If we want to buy it off the provider, it will cost a lot of money, which we don't have due to it being a new building. We have no choice in our provider and we do not want to buy the network off them. What will happen is the network ages and repairs, et cetera, need to be done. Our building has the network on our roof, but the company owns them and maintains the solar and they sell the energy on. Also, what happens if they go out of business and we all get stuck with something we never asked for in the beginning? We were told that if we want to change providers, the new provider would still have to buy the electricity off energy trade, so it would be more expensive. Right. Yeah. Okay. Again, this is a this is a really a very topical one for the discussion we've been having today. Um, again, not without knowing that, that the specifics of the side. Um, I think it's worth just stressing when we talk about network, we're talking predominantly it's about the articulation of a community um, that actually is owned by any. And if anyone tells you it's not, I can assure you it is. And you and uh, you know any kind of body corporate legal advice will will confirm this for you. The body corporate or the strata plan owns the owns the reticulation infrastructure. It's actually, a, it's a fixture and fitting of the building. It's not a discretionary asset. So it's it's no different to, you know, the floors in the hallway. You can't, that can't be owned by a third party. It's, always, it's, it's a core part of the, the building. So you own the infrastructure. What could be owned by the third party is solar panels, meter assets, components of the switchboard. So these are points on the, uh, along the network. Um, and so this gets back to the previous question, which is, well, actually can you buy those assets out and is the you may well be in an arrangement that actually is giving you good value and if it is giving you good value um i guess question would be why would you want to get out of that if it's not giving you good value talk to another provider because of course your existing provider is going to try and tell you very very difficult uh or you just can't exit um but that may not be the case and if it absolutely is the case i would think again the question mark would be is that a unconscionable contract because if if the contract is so far in favor of one party and not another, um, it's really questionable as to whether or not you should have uh, some form of exit. So I think maybe the answer to that one is more akin to, I can understand the problem. You probably have more options than you have been made aware of. And if you want to talk to us about it, we'll, bring, we'll, we'll show you what those options are. Um, it's certainly not the case that you're, you know, you're, not, you're not handcuffed into these things. Okay, um, so thanks for that offer of support for them too, Drew. Um, so that, that brings us to the end of the questions that were submitted, but we have had a few questions come in during the session. So we might just jump to those if that's okay. Um, sure. So this one was from Judy in Queensland. Does the seller have an obligation to provide internal data if requested? Yeah, so uh, absolutely a seller has an obligation to provide you with your meter data if it's requested. Um, the question of whether it's interval data is whether or not the meter is an interval meter. So if you have an interval meter, you ask for that data, you are entitled to that data and you don't have to pay for access to that data. Um, if you don't have an interval data, maybe it's an old basic meter where you're just getting a read every month, they, they must still provide that data to you. That data actually belongs to you, it doesn't belong to the retailer, to the on-seller. Okay, great. And we've had one from Ingrid. Um, how can the OC own the asset when there is an easement on the 88B about the ownership being the original developer? Uh, I probably need a bit more detail about that. Easements are complex and it depends on whether it's, if I'm talking high rise, is it uh, what type of land parcel it is. Easements always get a little bit complex. Uh, and uh, so it's a high rise mixed business. Um, again, we need more, of it. I'd need a bit more information to be able to answer that question. Um, depends on what infrastructure we're talking about, what kind of asset we're talking about. Okay, so maybe we should take that offline if Ingrid would like to yep. get in touch. Um, yeah, okay, that's probably best. To, yeah, there's a few extra points that have come through, but maybe we're best to take that one offline. Uh, but we have had one other one as well from Janine. Um, it's Queensland Sunshine Coast. Our contract for electricity with All Together is coming to an end in April. The committee are looking into other options and what to do. Is this something just the committee can decide on or do they need to come to the owners for a final decision? And we're also looking to get fibre optics into the building. Is this something that All Together can administer as the on-site manager wants to charge owners for this and added administration fee. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the first part of the question, so if you're looking, if your contract's come to an end and you're looking for a, essentially uh, to appoint a new service contractor, uh, if it's a service contract that is going to be longer than a year, that needs to be put to a vote of the committee. 
and uh, at, a, at, a, at, an, uh, at an AGM style or an EGM uh, meeting, in which case, essentially, yes, at that point, the owners are involved in that decision making. If it's less than 12 months, it's not a service contract. Actually, that can be done through a VOC, Queensland specific, or it can be done by the, the chair or, or the treasurer as a service contract for under uh, 12 months. So it's, it's not a service contract, I should say, if it's under 12 months. Uh, in terms of fiber, absolutely. Look, if uh, particularly if your contract's coming up for renewal, we would love to retain that business and we will talk to you about any other types of services uh, you're looking for. Um, this thing about, you know, people looking to charge fees for these kind of things, you know, we hear that quite often. Again, talk, I would always encourage you to talk to your existing provider because you'll probably find, and certainly would be with us, we would be quite happy to do that at our cost because we would like to retain your business. So there's lots of ways out there to, you know, get good value. You've got these providers, they want your business. Hold us accountable, get us to do some work for you and, and expect us to do it for, uh, as, a, as a, and expect your business to be our reward for that as opposed to us charging the fees. And you're the specialist in that area too, obviously. And so you have all the information that you can pass on. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Chris, and this I believe is from New South Wales, um, Sydney, New South Wales. Could you explain how and when an embedded network is a good solution to a strata property wanting to install a large solar PV system for the benefit of all owners rather than yep. just common property consumption um, and as an alternative to software um, such as sharing PV output software? Yeah, so there I get so really, and we'll, we'll talk about the solar, but let's just say, for example, internal generation, whether it's solar or any other form of generation. Right back to the beginning of the presentation, the reason embedded networks is so important is that it gives you the flexibility to install this type of generation and have and retain the benefit. Because where the where the benefit is is lost is at the point in time it connects to the grid. So what embedded networks do is they consolidate the grid connection to the gate meter point, and then everything internally is your own private network. So uh, having solar in an embedded network means that you can distribute that solar power within the embedded network without incurring any of the fees or charges we've talked about from the distributor or the, the protection relays um, that we uh, saw in, um, I think it was Bob's question. Uh, you, you, can, you can forego all of those kind of imposts, which means you get the commercial benefit stays within the community. The question then of whether or not that goes directly to the body corporate or to the residents, Look, electricity is a lot like water. It will flow wherever its first point of demand is. So it doesn't really matter where you install it. It's just going to go where it's, where it's wanted. The correct metering infrastructure will let you actually determine exactly where that power went. And then you can do some kind of financial or, uh, or uh, a data administrative reconciliation behind the scenes. We do this quite often. We've got a large development underway in Northwest Sydney. It'll have one of the largest solar arrays uh, in any residential community in the southern hemisphere and that's exactly what we do actually all the solar power goes directly into uh into the common areas and then just goes into wherever it needs to and then we actually work it all out financially behind the scenes so i wouldn't be con too concerned about the infrastructure side how it's actually installed if it's within an embedded network and you have a provider that has the sophistication to do those calculations and to do the administration then you can actually have that power the commercial benefit of that power delivered wherever you want it to be delivered. Great, okay. So we're coming up to the end of the session and we've probably got about five or so minutes to go. So we've just got, we might just cover one more question quickly um, before we move on. So this one was from John uh, and I believe John from New South Wales. I'm not really sure. I think it might be New South Wales. Uh, what do you consider to be a reasonable maximum term for a contract with an embedded network provider? How often should it come up for review? It's probably applicable for both states actually anyway, so. Yeah, no, absolutely isn't. It's a really good question. So, and, and the answer is straightforward. So if, if, if you're just appointing a provider to provide the retail services, like billing services and risk management services on your behalf, I would always recommend you go with a three-year term minimum. And the reason for that is that provider needs to actually put out to contract your electricity load. Uh, and the best way to get good pricing on the electricity load is to have, you know, a longer term contract. If you take a short term contract, you're always going to get a high, well, I shouldn't say always, I'm not a, I'm not a stock trader, a commodity trader, but you're more likely to get a higher price contract. So you get three years is the sweet spot. If you're having infrastructure installed and an infrastructure has been provided to you uh, by your embedded network uh, 
uh, operator, then I would we recommend a 10 year term. And the reason we recommend the 10 year term is that's the sweet spot by which you can install that infrastructure, recover the cost through the supply of services as opposed to a discrete fee and not see a, 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 a step up in the price that customers are expected to pay. Because obviously that's just a question of amortization over what over how long do we spread the, the investment that we've made to recover it, the longer it is, the lower the cost per unit, essentially, or the cost per kilowatt hour. So we normally recommend uh, a 10 year term where there's infrastructure installed. I think actually that can vary depending on how much CapEx has been deployed uh, at the site. And I think there was one more component to that question. How often would it come up for review? Uh, look, from our perspective, that's we, so we have in our, the way, every business will do this differently. The way we do this is that we have termination for convenience. So we don't want, our view is our services should be good enough uh, that our clients don't, um, locked into a contract, they, don't, they can't leave if they want to. So all of our contract clauses have termination for convenience. We do ask that if we deploy capital, that we're able to recover that capital. So you have to buy out the asset, but we do it on a flat linear depreciation basis. And it's always at cost. So if, I, if we spend $100,000, the contract will say, if you terminate in year one, you've got to give us $100,000 back. If you terminate in year two, it's 90, 80, 70, and so on. So it's just a simple flat linear. So the question of review is really review it at whatever time you feel is appropriate for your, uh, for your organization. Typically, that's if something's going wrong, you're not happy, or, or someone's offering you something else that you, you think is worth consideration. Um, and it shouldn't be relevant that you have period periodic reviews fixed in in the contract because you should always have the ability to select a new supplier and have freedom to choose if you should want to but that is different from for each provider it is something that if you're negotiating a contract with a provider you should be able you should insist on because um, there are providers out there that are offering that uh, so if your current provider isn't the fact that others are may consider they may consider changing their position Excellent. All right. Well, that, that pretty much takes us up to the end of the session, Drew. So uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us. It was really, really valuable. I think uh, everyone that's, that's attended the session has lots of information to take away from that. And it was quite practical as well, which was really great. Gave some really great examples um, because of those um, excellent questions that we had that came in. So thanks everyone for joining us that have, that have jumped into the chat. And um, and yeah, it's really great to, to see support for these sessions that we put on. And always at the end of the session we like to ask our presenters if they've got some really great news to share with us and I think this is a lovely story that Drew's got to share so I'll just hand back over to you Drew to, to share this with us. Yeah thanks well it's um, so you know the last couple of years have been I'm sure difficult and frustrating for for all of us and you know it doesn't matter whether you're an embedded network customer or not we've all felt the, uh, the frustrations. Um, we had a program in place during COVID which we put in place really early so when when I say early, I think we had this in place by the 24th of March, 2020. Um, so around the time the lockdown started, which was our community support program where any customer that was essentially impacted by COVID uh, and impacted would, was quite broad. So it was, you know, reduction in work hours, uh, stood down, um, uh, receiving any form of Centrelink benefit or concession, JobKeeper, you name it. We would, they could enter into a sort of a program with us where we would pay for their electricity for the next six months. And there were no sort of caveats around that. And it, there was no requirement for the customer to pay us back. So as we move to the next phase of COVID, I think we all understand that, you know, the, the environment looks like it's improving, but it's going to be here for a while. Um, we're looking to evolve that program to its next phase. And the next phase for us is what we're calling our COVID recovery plan. So particularly we see this in, in the inner city areas in Southeast Queensland. A lot of our embedded networks, they have retail and commercial spaces on the ground floor areas. Um, and with the impact of border closures and tourism being quite heavily suppressed, particularly around the Gold Coast, we've seen the vacancy rates of those units increase substantially. So we're now offering um, our clients, uh, whether you're already on the altogether uh, retail platform or if you've been a legacy customer, so you've been with us when it was meted cash and you're now with altogether solutions. Um, if you talk to us, we may be able to essentially fund the first three months of power for any incoming tenant for those uh, retail lots. And the idea of that, of course, is we want your buildings to be attracting uh, tenants back so that you get that vibrancy back, you know, you get the buzz. And you, once those retail units are full again uh, and operating, restaurants are operating, there's a buzz in the atmosphere. I think it's just a better overall community experience. 
So that program is now, now live. There aren't really any uh, caveats to it again. So, you know, just come and talk to us. Uh, the details will be shared and we'd be happy to look at what we can do. Excellent. That's wonderful. Drew, thanks so much for sharing that with us. And that sounds like a great program that, um, that Altogether has been giving back to the community. So thank you very much thank for that. You. We've had some really great comments come in from people saying it was a great presentation, very clear and open, um, lots of great information in there, good session. So thank you so much um, again. And if anybody in the session submitted a question, I think we pretty much covered all the questions that were submitted. If you did submit a question and we didn't have a chance to get to it, please feel free to jump onto the Lookup Strata site, go to the Ask a Strata question page and submit a question for us and we'll get that through to Drew. Maybe um, the session has actually opened a few sort of questions in your mind that you'd like some clarification on. So please send those through to us and, uh, and we'll get back to you. And um, yeah, we'll see you in sessions in the future. Keep an eye out from our regular communications as to what we've got coming up in the future. But, but it was really great spending the time with you, Drew, and hopefully we'll have you back again to talk about another aspect of uh, embedded networks as well in the future. Anytime. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you.